One of my most powerful memories does not take place on the beach with my friends, but instead in a hospital. I was just seven years old and had another seizure. One of seven I've had in my lifetime, and among dozens of hospitalizations I've had. And I just sat there in the hospital on an IV, waiting for my blood sugar to come up and my metabolic control to stabilize while watching Spider-Man 3. Yeah, that movie. On DVD, on a tiny TV, in an even tinier bed with my dad. Now, you may wonder why this scenario of all things bring me happiness. I mean, who wants to spend their day in a hospital watching an authorized movie? But it's in moments like these, moments when you feel most weak and lost, that you feel the strongest sense of clarity. I felt alone and helpless in the aftermath of a near-death experience brought on by a disease nearly every single hospital I've ever walked into did not know how to treat. And my dad, and a superhero like Spider-Man, brought me that sense of comfort that I was safe, I wasn't alone, and I could be helped. But even more than that, my own fascination with superheroes, as well as the very strong pop culture resurgence they've experienced since the 2000s, selects the desire to be the best version of yourself, to embrace your identity, to be a hero to others. And years later, it was these desires that brought me to unlock my inner superhero, to embrace my disease and control it and my life, rather than letting it and others control me. In this talk, I hope that you too will learn some key ways in which you can become your own superhero. Now, let's flash back to the year 2000, where our story begins. On June 15, 2000, me and my twin brother Zach were born. He was born two minutes prior to me. Over the seven months following our birth, my health mysteriously declined while my brother stayed fine. I could not tolerate breast milk nor formula and was constantly in and out of the hospital on an IV fluid just to stay alive. I was clinically obese at this point. My parents were puzzled and distraught as to what was wrong with me. Come January 2001, and I was diagnosed with glycogen storage disease type 1A, an orphan medical condition affecting only 6,000 people out of more than 7 billion worldwide. Now, to put that into perspective, growing up, I had never lived in the same town as anyone else with this disease. The diagnosis was immediately followed by a surgical incision to allow for the placement of a gastric feeding tube since I could not tolerate food nor drink. Notably, my brother was unscathed, and this was a dichotomy that took hold of my life for quite some time. Now, I'm sure you're all asking yourselves, well, what the heck is this disease? To put it as simply as possible, glycogen storage disease, or GST, is characterized by a missing enzyme in the liver. This missing enzyme means that I cannot release glycogen from my liver and need a constant stream of glucose in my body to prevent hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, seizures, or even death. My doctor, Dr. David Weinstein, prescribed me on a corn starch regimen, shaken and drunken with water, as soon as I was old enough to tolerate it in order to maintain my blood sugar. This regimen consists of six to eight doses of corn starch at set times around the clock. And because I have so much corn starch, I carry this bag around with me wherever I go. In it, I have an entire day's worth of corn starch prepared ahead of time, as well as any other medical supplies I need to keep my blood sugar stable and keep me alive. In other words, this bag right here is my lifeline. Now, if I'm even 10 minutes late for my cornstarch, my blood sugar plummets. 30 minutes late to result in a seizure. And if I miss my dose before I go to sleep, that is all but a guaranteed death sentence. On top of this, growing up, I could never get a full night's sleep without having to wake up in the middle of the night. Oftentimes, this consisted of just three and a half hours of uninterrupted sleep. A follow-up question I often get asked is, well, Jake, I understand that you need to have six to eight doses of cornstarch at set times around the clock. But what does that mean? How can you better quantify that? First of all, that's a great question. <laughs> and second of all, as an adult, I consume nearly a pound of cornstarch every single day just to stay alive. That is 1,200 calories a day stemming exclusively from cornstarch, roughly half the amount of calories I need to maintain my body weight at my size. Now, these calories are more or less empty calories. That is to say that I am no more full than I was before I had the cornstarch. And thus, I would eat just like anyone else would on top of these 1,200 calories. And that's how the hallmark of clinical obesity gets associated with this disease. Add on top of this that physical activity was next to impossible, that my blood sugar absolutely plummeting. And I felt helpless. Throughout my childhood, my family and I were told a multitude of things as people tried to dictate my life. When I was a baby, my parents were told that I would never be able to go to college. Yet here I am. They were also told that I would be in and out of the hospital so frequently that I would never lead life outside of it. 
Again, here I am. Oftentimes I was viciously bullied for my medical condition, where I was made fun of for being overweight, made feel self-conscious just for taking my medication, that I was some sort of freak in other people's eyes. Because of these comments, I constantly compare myself to others, seeing myself as lesser, inferior, not normal. Having a twin brother who did not have this disease and was not overweight only drove this idea into my head like a drill because when you're young and you have a twin, all you can do is compare yourselves to each other when you're the same age, have the same genes, the same likeness, the same parents. It's practically impossible not to. And so, with all this being said, superheroes and superhero movies were an escapism for me. Often depicted as mutants or aliens, typically alone or aloof, and not traditionally normal, I looked up to their powers and heroism. To me, Superman and Spider-Man showed me that there's strength in being different, and adversity is a way forward rather than backward. So finally, when I was 15 years old, I pushed my limits and became my own superhero. Due to recent information at the time, my diet had changed relative to my disease, emphasizing far less carbohydrates. I had an aha, light bulb moment, where I realized that I could not take control of my situation. I then spent hundreds of hours researching nutrition, weightlifting, and cardio, learning to maintain a caloric deficit despite consuming 1,200 plus calories of cornstarch a day. Miraculously, it worked. I lost over 20 pounds over several months. Me and my family were shocked. We never even imagined that it would be possible to get in shape with this disease. Now, that's not to say that I hadn't made concerted efforts before. I had a trainer, Jay, who was helping me stay active for nearly four years prior. A year or two into my working with him, he was diagnosed with late onset type 1 diabetes, but we bonded over our blood sugar problems. Nevertheless, the nutritional factor always left me helpless and out of shape. Hence my family's shock when I made it work all on my own. So, naturally, we realized we need to do two things. That is, one, raise awareness for GSD, and two, inspire and motivate. I made a video with my trainer. This video starts to raise awareness about GSD and diabetes, to show that you can control your disease, conquer any adversity that comes your way. To keep testing my limits, I ran a half marathon at just 17 years old, working closely with my doctor to accomplish this. I was the first person with GSD to do so under the age of 18, and the second overall, proving that the impossible could be done with this disease. I had to check my blood sugar and consume the candy Smarties every single mile, as well as consume cornstarch every couple miles just to keep going. I'll be running a full marathon later this year. Fast forward to today, and I'm in my third year at Vanderbilt, when I was told that I wouldn't even get to have a first year of college, let alone lead life outside of the hospital. I'm studying mechanical engineering and computer science in hopes of pursuing a career that creates technology that helps people in the same way that I've been helped. So, what should you take away from all this? Well, I wanna leave you with three ideas. One, be your own superhero. Your disease or medical condition or just any form of adversity in your life gives you strength and real life superpowers. You can accomplish anything because that adversity does not hold you back, but instead pushes you forward. On that note also, be proud of who you are. Don't let anyone change that. Our uniqueness defines our identities. But just like superheroes, our identities are a source for our powers. In that regard, don't compare yourself to others. Me and my brother become closer than ever by embracing our strengths and differences rather than competing to fulfill the same role. Two, enjoy the journey while pursuing any of your goals. I cannot stress enough how incredibly important it is to stay present and really appreciate where you are in life. Even if you're looking to improve, that absolutely does not mean you should reject yourself from the present moment. Three, finally, don't let anyone dictate your life or tell you what you can or should do. You and only you define what you're capable of and people's preconceived notions of you should never, ever affect that. So, with all this being said, go out and do the things that you or others thought were not possible. Go write that book that your friend said you weren't great enough to even start. Go run that Ironman that you thought you weren't even a good enough swimmer for. Go be your own superhero. Thank you.